I'm just a good man. I'm from the forest right here in uh, New York City. Uh, uh, I'm Sir Peterson. I'm uh, speaking a lot.
is um, we've got the tree and we've got branches. How do we start putting leaves on the trees and find out and find stories to tell? So in my book, I start in the prologue uh, with a quote from Toni Morrison, which goes as follows. Denver was seeing it now and feeling it through Beloved. And the more fine points she made, the more detail she provided, the more Beloved liked it. So she anticipated the questions by giving blood to the scraps her mother and grandmother told her, and a heartbeat. Denver spoke, Beloved listened, and the two did the best they could to create what really happened, how it really was. Something only Seth knew because she alone had the mind for it and the time afterward to shape it. And so when I reread um, this quote from Toni Morrison's Beloved, it struck me how much that that's exactly what I was trying to do, to take the memories of forebears who I did not know and to put blood and a heartbeat to the scraps of memory that they, that they had left. And that basically is then the way in which I approach my larger historical pro uh, 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 project. And here again, I'm reading a quote from my book. This time it's in my own words. We, we still hold certain truths about African Americans to be self-evident. That the phrase 19th century black Americans refers to enslaved people. That New York State before the Civil War denotes a place of freedom that blacks in New York City designates Harlem, that the black community posits a classless and culturally unified um, uh, society, that a black elite did not exist until well into the 20th century. The lives of my New York forebears belie such assumptions. They were born free at a time when slavery was still legal in New York State. They lived in racially mixed neighborhoods, first in Lower Manhattan, and then after the Civil War in Brooklyn, at a time when Harlem was a mere village. They were part of New York's small but significant community, and specifically its elite class. So that was the larger kind of, uh, my larger challenge was to kind of confront these assumptions that many people make about 19th century black New Yorkers. Now, you are all in Gotham, so you all know better, right? Um, but I can't tell you the number of people who still say, oh, Carla wrote a book about Harlem. Um, or people who say, uh, wow, slavery existed in New York. Wow, I didn't know that. So those, those are the kinds of commonplace assumptions I wanted to challenge. So why uh, family history? And this goes back to some of the things that Leslie um, talked about before. Um, I wanted to recreate the four beers of uh, the past of my four beers, and that was personal. I wanted to find out more about my family, and I wanted to take scraps of memories that were theirs, and I wanted to see whether I could put, as Toni Morrison says, uh, blood and a heartbeat to those scraps of memory. In the process, what I thought I could do, and this would serve kind of a larger community, is to bring up these issues of memory and forgetting. Why is it that we as individuals choose to remember something? Why is it that we don't want to remember? Remember, Toni Morrison says, this is a story not to pass on. So what are the stories we want to pass on? What are the stories we won't, we want to forget? How does that operate, not only on the individual level, but on the level um, of family? Um, another thing I wanted to do, and why I wanted to do my, this history of New York through my family, was to get to um, specificity. And I think Leslie talked about that earlier as well. Um, I needed to get to specific people and events. I had names, and I needed to attach stories to those names and no others. At one point in my despair, my husband said to me, just invent a grandfather, a great grandfather. <laughs> and I was like, really? Can I do that? And I was like, no, no, I can't. So it was the chase for specificity that became really important. Um, another for me was the issue of family, which is a very vexed uh, issue in African American uh, history. So if you go back to the 19th century and think about it, we weren't supposed to be have families. We weren't supposed to be family people. We weren't supposed to know anything about family, about the ties that bind, about nurture, about love. And that's why slave, the slave system could so easily separate uh, a, a husband and wife, mother and children, father and children, etc. 
So to me, it would make a very powerful statement if I could start to tell 19th century, 19th century African American history through the history um, of the family. And then finally, and Leslie knows more about this because I'm, I'm in an English department and um, on the verge of retirement, I feel that I can think of anything I want to, write anything I want to, but they can't say anything. But the whole idea of family history as legitimate methodology within um, the historical profession, I think, is a very important one. Um, can we find a way of telling it without lapsing into incredible subjectivity or, or just um, calling out people or whatever? Can we tell a really well-grounded um, history in that way? Um, so I'm going to start with the issue um, of memory. Um, and uh, talk a little bit, the two figures that I'm going to be talking about today are my great-great-grandfather, Peter Guignol, and my great-grandfather, Philip Augustus White. So if you have a family tree, um, you can uh, follow them on that. Um, so, and the other thing I want to point out is that if you're the central people in my story, New York is the central, is almost really the hero of my story. So the way in which I approached um, doing this history, the context that I chose was that of New York. His, uh, of New York. So I could have gone off and researched family members in Haiti and got to Haiti and so forth, but I really wanted place. I wanted to think about the way in which people, my ancestor, lived in a certain specific geographic space. So the first uh, person that I'm going to be talking about is my great great grandfather, Peter Guignol. His dates are 1813 to 1882. And then his son in law, uh, my great grandfather, Philip White, who's really kind of the hero of my story, his dates are 1823 to 1891. And um, uh, so these are two images of him. I had lots of problems for starters because I had nothing. My family had not, they were among those who had not chosen to remember, but who had chosen to forget. And I had one false story about, uh, a, a story that had been handed down to me about Philip Augustus White that later to, uh, proved to be only um, half tr true. Other than that, I had no family documents, I had no stories, except for these two um, photos and maybe um, a couple of others. The other problem that I faced was I had nobody to ask. My family was, is absolutely tiny, and I, there was nobody around me who I could ask anything. I finally found one person. Uh, she's a cousin who lives in Las Vegas, and we've met, and I'll come back to her a little bit later. So when I started out, I was like, this is going to be really hard because I've got nothing, and obviously people from that period um, didn't want to remember. This was a 19th century story people wanted to forget. What I found out, in fact, was that going through the records, that 19th century black New Yorkers really wanted to remember. They did not want to um, forget at all. And what had happened was that it was the lack of resources that had made it unable uh, for them to preserve. They had tried really hard to preserve through newspapers, through the different kinds of documents, through monuments and so forth, and had not been able to. So two examples, one is the Negro's burial ground, which you all know about, which was our cemetery throughout the 18th century. And then another were documents where James McKeon Smith talked about the way in which the black community had preserved documents of conventions and how all that got lost um, in the draft riots and other episodes of violence um, that just kind of swept through the city uh, periodically. Um, and so there, I was confronted with this um, um, the amazing fact that there had been this will to preserve, but the inability to do so. But that gave me heart to say, well, at least there must be something. Not everything could have been destroyed. So I went to the archives, and this is really a story about how I went through the archives, the Schomburg um, in particular, uh, but also the New York Historical Society, um, and so forth, and what I found. So um, I wanted to start off by talking then about how I went and found uh, material. And I want to start off but just by briefly mentioning that the records that we feel most comfortable with are where we start. 
um, that we turn to first and we get names, we get places, and we get dates. So those are basically death certificates, church records, city directories, um, um, and the census. So if I take Peter Guignol, um, what I find out in his death certificate is that both of his parents were born in the West Indies, and that's what it is, the West Indies, but nothing else. Um, I went to St. Peter's Catholic Church records, and there I found the name Guignol. And Guignol appears next to the name of white slaveholding families who had come from Haiti, i.e. the Berard family, wealthy whites who had been forced to flee. And so that gave me the impression that and they're co-signatories to certain documents, baptism, wedding, etc. And so that placed me, allowed me to speculate that this Guignol, uh, so this is uh, Peter's great Peter, my great-great-grandfather's father, um, was a white man from um, Haiti. Um, the city directories told me where the different places where um, uh, Peter Guignon had lived, the trades that he had as porter, tobacco business, uh, a tobacco business, and as a barber. And then um, the census told me places where he lived. Um, on Greenwich Street, York Street, and then um, from the late 1850s on in, in Williamsburg, uh, which, yes, by then had become part of Brooklyn. If I go to oops, my great great, my great grandfather, what I find in his death certificate is that his father was named Thomas White, that he came from England. His mother was named Elizabeth Steele, and she was from Jamaica. Nothing else, of course, no story to put together there. Um, the census li uh, puts them in Hoboken in 1830, living together as white man and African-descended woman, which is a pretty remarkable thing as an intact family. Again, I can, play, I can trace Philip White through the directories, um, the census and tax assessments, and follow all the places where he lived and the way in which he ended up um, uh, in the trade as um, uh, a pharmacist, having his own pharmacy in Lower Manhattan. And I'll come back and talk to that, um, about that later. So what I found that going through these documents is what we get is we get the tree trunk, we get branches, but we don't get leaves. There are no stories to embellish. So that was my question. How can I find stories to be able to tell a real history not only of my family, but of the larger black community um, in New York. So the problem is that the paucity of records that we have, how things were destroyed, um, uh, and that also that because of that, so many stories we get, to the extent that they're told, they're told through white institutions, uh, whether it's institutions, newspapers, the New York um, Daily Tribune, or whatever. So to find black perspectives on black history in New York proved to be quite a different, difficult thing. So the method I used is something that I'll, I call digging deeper and digging sideways. So digging deeper is just going into an archive and drilling down, down, down as far as you go until you're absolutely exhausted and your husband says, why haven't you finished this book yet? <laughs> um, and digging sideways is going to places like the New York Historical Society, calling for the Manumission Society papers, white institution, and just saying, well, maybe, maybe I'll find something there going on and on and on until your husband says, why haven't you finished this book yet? <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, that process. So I was really lucky because, um, uh, and I worked then through intuition, so maybe somebody has a better idea how to go about doing historical research. Um, but I did it purely through intuition. So I went to the shop work, and this is a question really of digging deeper. And I found a collection called the Rhoda Golden Freeman Collection. And Freeman had written a book called uh, The Free Negro in Antebellum, New York City, something like that, that came out in the 1970s. And then she had left um, her collection of papers pre-computer, so all of those shoeboxes, right? Those little files, yeah. And in shoebox number eight, I think it was, um, I found um, this, oh, okay. Uh, I found this, um, a page which was torn from a scrapbook, 
and I recognize the name Phil Augustus White, which is, um, and that's his obituary, and you can't see, um, uh, really, uh, scanning helps, scanning <laughs> <laughs>
uh, and Elizabeth Marshall lived on Collette Street, which is today Center Street. So I went down to the um, uh, municipal archives and I went through the uh, tax, uh, the land tax assessments, and I found that three African American families lived on this street. Um, my family, the Marshalls, the DeGrasses, and the um, Crummels. And so I started to investigate them. This time, they were all referred to as African. One of the really interesting things I found out was that these people hailed from all corners of the globe. So um, Boston Crummel came directly from Africa, enslaved. He was 100% African. Um, his wife, Charity Hicks, was a mixed race descendant of the um, Quaker, white Quaker Hicks family. George de Grasse was adopted by a French admiral from Calcutta, India. He married a woman named Maria Van Surly, who was of Dutch and Moroccan um, uh, ancestry. Teresa, <laughs> we're Dutch together. <laughs> um, and uh, um, finally, uh, my family, Joseph Marshall, was from Maracaibo, Venezuela, and uh, his wife was from, was a Hewlett, so she was from Long Island. And I, I pause on this because I think it's so fascinating that we don't, well, we do, you guys do, but many other people don't think about backgrounds and what did African mean at that time? Was it that everybody came from Africa? No, actually there was this incredible mixed race in this which you've all found out in your genealogical work and which I have yet to um, pursue. Um, so, let me see, oh, um, um, all right. So what I wanted to show um, is to go back to the obituary. So I just want to talk about a couple of the details that I got from the obituary. One is that Peter Guignol went to the Mulberry Street School, and um, the school, the, the obit writer who um, names the students, but nothing more. So this is the Mulberry Street School, which is very famous at the time for educating young men who turned out to be the black leadership in New York and in, uh, in, uh, in the antebellum North generally. Um, and so here are some of the images. This is James McKean Smith. I'm sure many of you have heard um, of him. Uh, he um, uh, became a doctor and a pharmacist, and I'll be mentioning him again later. This is Charles Reason, who went on to become a professor, a teacher in New York schools. This is Patrick Reason, uh, who became a very, uh, Charles's brother, who became a very well-known engraver. Um, this is George Downing, uh, who was a fervent integrationist, worked for um, integration throughout his life, became very close to Charles Sumner um, in the postbellum period, and it said that <coughs> Sumner died in his arms. This is Alexander Crummel, famed um, Episcopal theologian, who we don't know nearly enough, of, enough about, but he was the mentor of um, W.E.B. Du Bois, and it's safe to say that had Alexander Crummel not been his mentor, he would not have the souls of black folk. Um, okay, so I'm going to. So what I what to do then is once you've got all of these names uh, um, it, and to find the stories. I found it by going to white sources because the African free schools were set up by uh, white institutions. So that was one source I went to, um, in particular Charles Andrews' history of the um, African free schools. I also found out more information by going to newspapers, uh, Freedom's Journal, Colored American, Frederick Douglass' paper, the weekly Af Anglo-African, to find out more about what these young men did after school. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the next story. Yeah. Um, what? <laughs> you want this story? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you going to choose? I mean, is it okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is, is, this is another situation of digging deeper um, and sideways. So, um, uh, the obituary of Peter Guignol told me that he had a second marriage to a woman named Cornelia Ray, and you can check her out on um, your uh, uh, on the family tree. And I wanted to find out more about her. I knew nothing about Rebecca Marshall, but at least I could find out something about her. 
and she was actually a member of a very prominent Ray family. Um, and I found the obituary of, his, of her father, Peter Ray, and the story was that he, at the age of 11, the Lorillard Tobacco Company mm. had hired him as an errand boy, and he'd risen through the ranks, and by the time of his death in 1882 or 1883, he was one of the superintendents at the Lorillard Tobacco Family, the brand new uh, uh, tobacco factory, the brand new tobacco factory uh, in, um, uh, in Jersey City. So I wanted to find out more about the Lorillards, and here again, I think um, Leslie mentioned this earlier, you think Lorillards, you know, they were Knickerbocker society, there'd be a ton of information, not so much, it's really hard to find. And the family living today did not want to talk to me. <laughs> um, so I went down to the New York Public Library, I went up to the Aaron's Collection, which is the back of the collection, what is a literary, literary critic doing going through tobacco files? And this is what I came up with. Um, and basically, it is a note uh, talking about Peter Ray and the fact that um, in 1843, he uh, had become, was working for the Lower Lords no longer as an errand boy, uh, but as a, a judging tobacco. So they would take him with him to the tobacco uh, auctions and he would go around and judge tobacco leaf, what was good for snuff, what for um, cigars, what for et cetera, et cetera. So here's an instance, one of many, where skill trumped race. And since this guy was really good at this, they were willing um, uh, to take him. And so this was another example where, yeah, I should have been writing the book, but this was really an important detail. <laughs> um, my next, okay, now I'm passing on to Philip White. Um, and again, I went back to his obituary, um, as well as to a eulogy that George Downing, do you remember his image, uh, wrote and was published in the Brooklyn Citizen um, some years, uh, about a year or several months after his death. Um, and so what I, I was able to mine the obituary um, and the eulogy for information, but then also, so that was my digging deeper, but also going digging sideways and looking at white institutions uh, for um, relationships that uh, uh, Philip might have had, and indeed I found. So this is, uh, Philip went to the Lawrence Street School, different from the Mulberry Street School, and not nearly, 10 years later, not nearly as good. I went through the Public School Society notes at the New York um, Historical Society, 80 odd volumes, and in uh, volume, I think, 65, I found this, which is a note that says that Philip White made fires in the school building for three months for, and got paid three dollars to keep the school building warm. And there was another one that said that his uh, mother, Elizabeth Steele, was whitewashing um, the, uh, uh, the, the walls. So it showed how poor, after the death of Thomas White, uh, when Philip was 11, how poor this family was and how they really had to scramble. So just to go back a little, and this is why I chose these um, photos. Um, he went to school, his teacher, and this is a story now about mentorship. This is his teacher, Charles Reason, at the Lawrence Street School. He comes out of the school, and they don't know what to do with him. His mother says, go apprentice with this engraver, Patrick Reason. And he does it, but he doesn't take to it, so he leaves after three months. And he goes, and he apprentices, in the uh, uh, pharmacy of James McEwen Smith and has a four-year apprenticeship there. And so my point here is to show how mentorship, uh, how with the um, Mulberry Street School, the white teacher, Charles, uh, Charles Andrew, was the one who really nurtured and directed these children. By Philip's generation, it was black men um, mentoring black youth, and I think that that's really important. While he was at, um, and so this is George Downing who writes the amazing <laughs> eulogy. While he was at the um, uh, apprenticing for uh, um, James B. King Smith in, um, in his pharmacy, uh, Philip also decided 
to go to the College of Pharmacy of the City of New York and uh, for two years and then get a diploma. So I wanted to find out more about this College of Pharmacy and could not find a trace of it in New York City. And I think this is where I was sobbing on Leslie's shoulders and she was, if you were like, give it up, you know? And I was like, I'm gonna do one last try. And I went out to the Wisconsin Historical Society where I was told that they had the biggest collection of pharmacy papers. And there, at the very end of the day, 10 minutes before leaving, in a, in a folder uh, marked miscellany, I find this following note, which basically says that Philip White had indeed graduated, gotten his diploma in 1844 from the College of Pharmacy of the City of New York, but it had taken 30 years for him to be accepted as a member of the, of the uh, college, which is like membership in the Bar Association or the or an AMA, whatever. So that I thought was really interesting. And I think it's like, if you could read it by the second group of, uh, last slide, we cheerfully um, accept him um, as a member. Um, okay, um, let me see. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say before I move over to my digital archive and show you that, and I wasn't going to do so much of that except that um, the previous talker got me like, okay, all right, let's do some of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, um, um, so the poems, never mind, there's that poem on education, the poem on Trinity um, in the, uh, uh, on that scrapbook page, and that's just to point out the degree to which Philip was devoted to education and to St. Philip's. And all the money he accumulated, he became quite wealthy in pharmacy. He gave back to those institutions. Mm. So the other important thing to me was geography. And to point out that where people lived, where blacks lived in lower Manhattan really mattered. And so there was some discussion of maps and so forth. So I went to the map room um, at the uh, New York Public Library, and I gave um, the map person three addresses, Grand Street, White Street, Vancouver Street. And he was like, looked at it, he said, this is a story of social asset. This person went from a, a wooden frame home to a first class brick dwelling with a slate roof, et cetera, et cetera. So maps are also important um, archival resources. So the la I want to end with this story, um, which is about the draft riots, where you go to see that how all of these elements of what I've been talking about come together, um, and I'm going to do it through my digital archive. So um, the last thing I'm going to show here is a, an ad um, for Philip's um, drugstore. Um, and uh, if you see, it says white, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, he's taken out an ad in the weekly Anglo-African. I only found it by going page by page by page by page. Um, and he's advertising for uh, a hair product that will restore luster and uh, I don't know what else, to dry, rusty hair. Okay. Um, but he was obviously um, a, a man of means by then. He could take out the ad. He, he was doing really, really well. Um, okay, so now, oh, how do I get to my... Uh, okay. Okay, all right. So the last story I'm going to tell is through my um, digital um, archive. So the... Um, uh, the address is archive.blackgothamarchive.org. And I decided to do this after I finished my book because at the time I thought I didn't want to let go of the material. Now I'm not so sure. Um, but also because I wanted to reach a broader uh, public. So my idea was that this would be for some, uh, a digital archive to find out about stories about a black Gotham for people who can't afford books for people who are not really readers and don't particularly want to spend a lot of time reading, and also to showcase more images, because I think we've seen the degree to which images are really powerful and can tell the story better than almost um, anything else than, than words. And so what the archive does that the book doesn't do, it inverts the relationship between word and image. So now the image is the dominant feature and the word is secondary, is more illustrative. 
I think it also gives a greater simultaneity because you can go back and forth with greater ease rather than looking, going back and looking at the index and say, okay, on page whatever, whatever, you can just kind of uh, manipulate. Um, and then also to add stories so that my um, Black Gotham is, alas, a, a never-ending story. So this is what the um, home page looks like. And I'm going to illustrate how it works through the last story, which is um, the New York draft riots. And I am not used to doing anything without a mouse, so this is very complicated for me. Uh, so Philip is, um, okay. Um, we are in 1863, and there's an amazing story about Philip and the draft riots. So the way I did this was actually um, kind of following things that have been suggested earlier. I start with the context. This is the Civil War breaking out. This is an image that I got um, from off the web. It's in the public domain, so you just cut and take it and, and insert it into here. So Civil War breaks out. It's the story behind um, the draft riot. Uh, then I tell the story of the draft riot, um, and here I took images um, from Harper's and Frank Leslie's, um, and the way I did it was the expensive way. I got it from libraries and paid a ton of money to get the, um, the, the reproduction um, and then the permission to use. And so now that I'm going to learn something about scanning, I can take my scanner right and do it. Uh, but I did get it as a TIFF file, and believe it or not, I managed to learn how to convert a TIFF to a JPEG and also to crop images. This can be done. <laughs> so this is basically general stories uh, about um, African Americans in the draft right. I have a lot more images that I'm going to um, add to it. Uh, this is the story of the colored orphan, uh, well, I'm going to skip that because uh, time is running out. Uh, yeah, this is the story I want to tell, and this is going to be my closing. Um, so uh, through the um, uh, uh, Marich Alliance papers, I found this story, um, or this note, uh, let's see. Well, you can't read it, it's the one up there, and I don't want to take time out to make it bigger or whatever. But basically, it's a note that a police sergeant writes to Albro Lyons, and so Albro and Mary, are, uh, uh, Joseph, are reproduced there. Um, do you want me to do this? <laughs> um, basically saying, I have received yours from the bearer, and I cannot answer whether I can comply with it. I will see you this afternoon, as I mentioned in the, note, in, in the other note, as I have been excused from my captain for that purpose. I cannot say today what will occur tomorrow. I will be at said drugstore at 3 o'clock p.m. this day with horse and wagon. And so what I do, uh, Albert Lyons and Philip uh, White lived on the same street, Vanderporter Street, which is depicted there. And the, his drugstore was right around the corner. It was like a block and a half away. And I can only surmise, but I do surmise, that that drugstore was that of Philip White. So the backstory is that um, the mob had come, the Irish mob, and assaulted Albert Lyons' uh, home and pretty much demolished it. They knew that it was a stop, or they, could, they guessed that it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. He was a wealthy man who showed off his wealth, and they just did not like it and just wanted to destroy him. So his house is destroyed, but he says, but the note suggests, me, go to Philip White's drugstore and you'll be safe there. And I know that Philip White's drugstore was safe because I found the story repeated many times that people had come to his neighbors, good neighbors had come to him and said, the mob is coming, you need to get out. And he said, no, what have I to fear? My neighbors will protect me. And in fact, they did. And they were, the area by then was largely poor um, uh, Irish. And so you have this amazing situation of the Irish coming to demolish um, black homes and black wealth and Philip's Irish neighbors say, no, that's not going to happen. 
So once again, I think it's this combination of personality, of who you are, uh, how you, how, what your business skills are, and where you live. And it all comes together in a positive way for Philip White, where what he's done is create this situation of interdependence, where um, his, he depends on his Irish neighbors, and they depend on him. And uh, what he gives, he not only gave them um, medicines uh, for free when they couldn't afford it, but he also gave them food and clothes and so on. So this shit tells another kind of story that I think is important um, for us to um, recognize. So, okay, um, so that's the end of that story. Um, and so just in closing, I was able to get at a lot of stories that were able that I, in which I could tell the story not only of my family, but also of black New Yorkers. What I was never able to get at were the more personal, intimate stories. So I'm not going to go back to that um, scrapbook page, but the two personal poems, um, one it was references and refers to a man who goes and knocks on heaven uh, at heaven's gates after death. And um, St. Peter says, uh, what are your references? And he says, my wife and children, and daughters three. And that's in fact what Philip had, a wife and three daughters, and they are his references. And the last story, the last poem is, I can't remember what the title is, oh, if only you understood. And it's, if only you understood under this stern exterior, the, the depth and emotional capability of this person. And once again, I think that that's a reference um, to, uh, uh, to Philip White. So the last thing I want to say is that... Can we go back to the other page? No. Okay. Um, at the top, you'll see... Um, yes, so you'll see contact. And so my, what I want to do, and this is an appeal to all of you, is mine is not the only Black Gotham story, right? Um, I know, Teresa, <laughs> that a lot of you have other Black Gotham stories. So I've let this go for a while, but when I come back and start working on it again and get some more stories up and get to it, it's a, a place where I feel comfortable, I would love for people to come and add uh, contact and contribute, contribute, to contribute if you feel that you want to, your stories uh, to my family's story, so that at the end we don't have just one single family story, but we have a much larger story of New York City, of Blacks in New York City. Thank you.
that those were the two populations that they attacked. So that the orphanage became at once the, um, the symbol of white elitism that was giving away its benevolence, uh, undoubting benevolence to undeserving black people, and then black children, uh, part of the black community, who, um, and the black community, the fault was being, the war was being fought over there, but they weren't doing any of the fighting. So people like to talk, talk about that story because um, it really speaks to the real, to, to, to the dynamics of race and class that were going on at the time, but the real victimization of um, blacks as well. And so the story I tell about Philip White, but also um, about others, are of blacks who fight back. This story really presents blacks as total, and children, what could they do, right? Um, but there are kind of points of resistance, which is what I also try and bring out. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing your history and archive of information. My question is, is there an organization, research source, government agency, private effort that collects and associates information for specific objectives. Uh, can you be a little bit more specific? What specific? In other words, there's endless research information from the Schomburg to data, census has been carrying on. Is there a general basic research that focuses on collectively putting stuff together for an objective? Um, not that I know of, and Leslie might be able to answer that at greater length. Um, what, I, what I see, and I told you my methods were totally intuitive, which yes. is why it took, me, it took me 11 years. And maybe if I were more systematic, it, it wouldn't have. But not that I know of. So you go to the Schomburg and you get everything from the Schomburg. You go to the New York Star, blah, blah, blah. But you're saying of something that collects it all together? Not, not, not that I know of. <coughs> and you're pointing out a real lacuna, a real, yeah. And how hard would that be in a way? Yes. Mm -hmm. With by who? Yeah. Now, was that based on her memoirs? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, a lot of it is right out of the of the memoir. Um, but it is a gorgeous, uh, uh, it's a beautiful, so this is Tanya wow. Bolton's book you. on the Richer Lines, and it is still, she says, her best selling book. So it is really wonderful the way she tells it. Um, all of that material comes out of, of the memoir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another thing, and I nobody asked me where are the women, um, and I'll just say that uh, Maritza Lyons, in my in my story, she's the observer and the research and narrator for much of it. But embedded within the uh, her memoir, she eventually comes to life as a school teacher um, in Brooklyn in the, uh, uh, the 80s and from the 80s on as spearheading the Black Women's Club movement. And um, Tanya does not go into that part. Um, I do at the end of my book. But that is for, for telling women's history, there are certain parts of that memoir that are really invaluable. Yes. Thank you. And I'm glad I came today because my wall is at that orphanage. My grandmother, Olga Roberta French, was a child at that orphanage. Wow. wow. That's the wall I'm at. And I'm trying to find out more information why she was student at that orphanage. So I'm glad I came here today. Wait, so who, who was there? My great grandmother, my mother's mother, Olga Roberta French, <coughs> on the census. On the census before, she had two names. Olga Roberta French was from Philadelphia when she came to New York. But then on the uh, report, at, on the census, she used a different name, Olga R. France. With, oh, maybe you spoke it wrong. F R A N T Z. And so, how do you know she was there at the time? When I went to the census report, she said she was at an orphanage. And that's the offer thing listed on the census report. Wow. wow. So you want to talk to Stanton <laughs> right over there. <laughs> because, no, Stanton found a family uh, where the boy yeah. was, 
what was the name again? Barnes. Barnes uh, was a was at the orphanage, and in the 1920s was it maybe? Yeah. Right. He wrote an account, and the account you can get a copy of the account, and. You know, I didn't tell me until after I finished the book. I mean, really. Um, but what is really interesting is that is maybe the only black perspective that I've been able to find that I know of on the assault on the colored orphan um, asylum. There was a black matron there, but as far as I know, she never told the story. And the stories we get are in the white newspapers and they're very sympathetic and they, they really evoke the horror of the moment but it's it, they're white voices so this one the Barnes one is uh, is a reflection by a, a, a black person so and talk to Sam I will, and there are no records at all in New York City and like in any records um, of what um, of the student that was there no records at all at all well there are there are records of the colored orphan asylum um, at the New York Historical Society. But as far as I know, when I went through them, there's not a lot on the riots, right? Not on the riots, specifically, but it depends on when she was there. It has a moving wall of, you know, for privacy reasons. So you have to check and see how far forward, you know, if you were looking for that particular but when I went through the minutes of the whatever, it was I was amazed at how little there was on yeah on the draft riots. There's really very little. But those yeah. records for people who have ancestry um, in New York and you think I mean those records are amazing family records. The women in the pre Civil War period took whole histories of the families when they could and of the children they brought in. So you know if you figure out that you are connected to that orphanage. Um, and you can get into it in the time period, you know, that's open. It could be, it could be useful. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Um, basically, why is the school records in New York Sorry? The school records, where you can find them. At the New York Historical Society. So the first ones are, are in the Manumission Society papers, and that mostly addresses the African free schools, right? Um, and then there's the Public School Society, which is a whole separate record, and they're in bound volumes. Um, and uh, then after that would be the Board of Education. So to track black schools, it would be um, the Manumission Society, the Public Schools Society, and then the Board of Education. Um, another thing, and I didn't have time to talk about this, but on education, my great grandfather Philip White helped to, he didn't help to found, but he became a very active participant in the Society for the Promotion of Education Among Colored Children. And the best sources for that is, believe it or not, the New York uh, Daily Tribune, which reports extensively um, on what they did. I don't. I don't think there are any extant records, right? <laughs> um, uh, so no proceedings. I mean, that's again the, the difficulty of, for blacks to preserve, right? They were there, but they weren't preserved. But the New York um, uh, Daily Tribune, because there was no black newspaper at the time, the Tribune really became the the black the local newspaper for blacks and reported extensively on activities, in particular education. Yes. Yeah. You can reconcile something for me. If it was illegal to read and write and talk about the United States in that period, what happened to blacks who were caught reading the newspapers of New York City? Did anything happen? Well, that was in the South. That was not true in the North. It was, it was legal to um, be able to read and write. And in fact, when the Manumission Society decided to create African free schools, they said, so manumission is the idea of emancipation, freeing slaves, and so forth. And so what they said was, what is going to end slavery? Um, you know, we need to end slavery, but education. Education is going to be a tool for ending slavery. So they were very much on board on black education. And it, um, their movement, the, the, the starting of the schools happened in the, started in the 1790s. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you. We're going to have a few remarks from the LDS.
LDS Church uh, in closing, but before we do, I want to acknowledge two genealogy colleagues um, who have worked all day uh, to assist us with information. Um, they are uh, the Kelvin Smith, president of uh, New York's Genealogical and Biographical Society. Nixon, who heads up the LDS Church Family History Library here in New York. So um, we're glad that all of you have come. We hope that you will be continue to be inspired, continue to do your research, continue to document, 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 and um, continue to tell the stories because there is tremendous skill intellect, talent, um, perseverance, aspiration, and contribution in African ancestry people, and we need to we need to revel in our history and we need to tell those stories. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate your uh, patience, your willingness to bring energy and enthusiasm here. Um, there are many of you who do such a marvelous work. I appreciate the thoughts and words that were shared here today. It's motivated me to get out and do my own family history. Um, perhaps you could teach me. <laughs> uh, I know you could. I uh, appreciate Dr. Leslie Harris, Marks, David Kleiman, Dr. Carl Peterson for coming, traveling, and being here, sharing uh, your thoughts and words with us. Uh, there are many here who have uh, worked behind the scenes to make this a success. This is our ninth year uh, hosting and having this uh, joint relationship with the African American Historical and Genealogical Society. And it's a, it's a great relationship we want to keep uh, in store. And so I appreciate you being here. I uh, would just like to uh, specifically thank uh, Mindy Christensen, standing here at the corner, who's at the marvelous uh, <laughs> Putting this all together, and for her great step, and those you see uh, working here on this floor, up on the fourth floor. Uh, I strongly encourage you to take a few moments just to fill up the evaluation. It's a, a remarkable resource to help us better prepare and make these more meaningful, more valuable to you. So please take it seriously, and perhaps uh, as you exit the room here, pass it to, to Mindy. I'll remind you that we do have refreshments up on the fourth floor, free to partake of. There's an elevator actually on both sides, but for collecting evaluations, I'll encourage you to go up this way. And may I just say, may God bless you in your efforts in furthering your understanding of your family history and understanding your genealogy. I look forward to hearing uh, successes and joys in years to come. Thank you. The Second Year the Geology Conference that comes to an end. Uh, today, March 9th, uh, 2013, African American Genealogy uh, Research uh, here in Holland. Uh, huge sources, uh, population uh, participants in today's uh, uh, program. Carla uh, Peterson. Uh, we also have um, a lot of contributors. Uh, uh, you got his name and birthday. And uh, also, uh, in participation uh, today, uh, it's also uh, Clement, uh, uh, David Clement, uh, uh, a computer publisher, historian, and uh, educator. Uh, who has spent almost 25 years of personal and professional experience in uh, Georgia family history. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's a refreshment on the uh, fourth floor and all invited to participate. Thank you so much. Enjoy. So uh, how did you feel today? How was the feeling participating today in the meeting? All right. Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was the feeling coming to having been able to stay uh, to the end? Oh, did you learn anything today? Oh, did yeah, you feel a good feeling. Yeah, good feeling. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what did you feel? Feel 
enlightened. Enlightened, yeah, you're yeah. enlightened. Right. Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you. All right. You, you. Mem you a member of the group? Uh, well, we are Republic Reporters. So we